Great. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction, introduction, Philip. And um, Sir Robbie Said, it's really, really good to be on the platform with you this evening. I thought I would start, uh, Robbie, by picking up on something that, that Philip uh, said. So, so Philip and you were both involved in Conservative student politics. And indeed, your brother Nick came into Parliament at the same time as I came into Parliament in, in 1997. My first question to you really is, why didn't you, as it were, follow your brother and go down the parliamentary path? And why did you side, decide that broadcasting was the area that you wanted to be involved in? Um, <clears throat> good question. Uh, first, I want to say for those that um, haven't followed Ruth Kelly's career in the same way that I have, um, Ruth was a, a, a Labour minister. And I just want to say, without being partisan, if the Labour Party had more ministers like Ruth was, then I think they would have been in a very different, very different position. Um, so one of the things about going into, people go into politics for a range of reasons, um, and like any job, and, but I, I saw the sort of the warts and all of my brother's career um, as he went into, into politics, um, and one of, probably one of the reasons you <laughs> left politics. Um, it, um, but also, <clears throat> I, this is a genuine, um, it sounds a very trivial reason for going into broadcasting. I, was, I remember sitting at home watching a program um, on, there's a channel called uh, BBC One regional program called Newsroom Southeast, that probably that doesn't exist anymore. And they had this report about the changes they were making to the National Health Service. And the reporter, as a matter of fact, referred to it as privatisation. It was ludicrous bias inaccuracy. So rather than moan about it, I decided, OK, I, I care about impartiality. I care about accuracy in journalism. Well, what, I could moan about it. I could, well, those days there was no Twitter, but if there was, I would tweet about it. Um, and I decided, OK, I'm going to go in and um, try and change it. And the BBC has a commitment uh, to impartiality and accuracy. So I decided to take my political sort of interest in that direction. Very interesting. Was there anybody in your family or immediate environment when you were growing up that had an influence on that thinking? What, in broadcasting or...? In broadcasting or politics or the combination? Uh, no. So other than the, the standard arguments one had over Sunday lunch with a slightly grumpy father. Um, uh, no, so, so I was saying to you earlier, a great influence on me was my elder brother, who's four years, by the way, just, just for BBC fact-checking. <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, look, I mean, I don't, it's much better now in education, where I think uh, institutions like, like this and, and schools are much better at guiding young people into future careers and having conversations uh, with, I mean, Walder Grove School, where my girls went to, uh, are very close to here. They have a huge programme in the sixth form of bringing in people from different walks of life to give advice to, to the girls there. Um, that didn't happen when I was um, going through school and university. So, you know, just snatching anything really and uh, and so that's why you know I was interested in politics conversations with my brother and for the reasons I cited it seemed like well actually there is another even more trivial reason uh, a friend of mine um, worked for some PR company and I ended up on the program called On the Record with, with Roy Castle and I was the official timekeeper for the window cleaning competition wow. and I looked at the people there all these BBC types <laughs> literally messing about. I thought, that's what I want to do. You spend a lot of time asleep and a lot of time at work. If you're going to be at work, at least do something that's not boring. So that is a very high-minded reason for going into broadcasting. Well, it's certainly yeah, served you well over the years, so, so well done, but not a conventional approach to, uh, to communications or, or politics, actually. Um, so, so as for you, yours wasn't a particularly conventional path into parliamentary politics or representational politics either. You decided to get involved in, in the European Parliament. So what, what, were your, what was your thinking in, um, in determining that that was the route that you wanted to take? Um, it, I, I think it just happened. I mean, I, 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 when I went into politics, I did go with the intention of seeking a, a parliamentary seat. Um, mm. And I, I, mean, I joined the Conservative Party in 87 as a student. And over 18 years, I fought five elections and lost five elections. So I wasn't a great sort of a role model for people. Um, um, and over that time, I'd fought two local elections, one GLA election, one general election, one European election. 
and, it, and, it, and eventually got elected. And I think what happened for the European selection was I was applying for seats after 2001 general election and the European selection came up and I thought, well, I'll give it a try. But that's all it was. I didn't have any great passion to go into European politics. I, I had a passion to go into politics mm. and be a politician uh, for various reasons, um, but um, not necessarily European politics. And that's just the way it happened. Mm. But you were there for 14 years, so quite a long time. Yes, I was. I don't think anyone wanted me back here. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, did try to come, I did try to come back to British politics, um, but uh, I, I'm not sure whether it was whether they really didn't want me here or they thought I was doing a good job or whatever. But each time I tried to come back, I was either not selected or told to you know, stay where I was. I was doing a good job. But can, I just, can I just interrupt him yeah. there? He's been too modest because at this election, numerous people approached um, him to actually fight a Conservative safe seat. As always, very, very modest. That's so, so you, you had the opportunity I to had come the opportunity, back now, I had the opportunity but you chose to not to yes, take it. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I got to a stage where you do ask yourself why are you doing this, you know, mm. why, why are you doing that. I went to politics and I had a very strong drive and reason to go into politics. I mean, if you look at my own background, my, my, my father came to Britain in the 50s, my mother came in the 1960s, to, you know, we kept working class immigrant family, my father worked on the railways, then worked on the buses. And they always used to, you always used to tell me that there's no limit to what you can achieve if you're prepared to work hard, if you believe in God mm. and you believe in yourself. Um, but also, one of the things I found when I was growing up, a lot of kids from my background always put up their own barriers. Mm. They always said, we can't achieve anything, you know, because we're the wrong colour or we're the wrong class. And my parents always inspired me. They said, look, no, don't listen to them. You can achieve anything you want to. And I think one of the things that drove me was I thought, if I could achieve something, given my own background, hopefully I could inspire others mm. to do that. And there were two platforms that I thought were open to me. One was to be incredibly successful at business and, be, and, and you know, be one of these business people who goes around the world, um, you know, sort of evangelizing or to try politics. Mm. I don't think I was, would have been a very good business person. So politics was, was a route that gave me a platform to hopefully try and encourage more people to come through. And you became leader of the Conservative group in, in Brussels. And for someone who's not a, you know, all out supporter of uh, our involvement in Europe, and I know that you are a Brexiteer, even though we don't want to go down that route specifically, and I get the impression it was a sort of balanced decision for you. Can you tell us a little bit about how you think EU institutions could be reformed to work better for the populations that they represent? Sure. I mean, I mean, I mean I'm, I've, I've always been very pra pra pragmatic about things. The fact is I was elected as a member of the European Parliament, and that, that meant I had a job to do. And so my job, as far as I was concerned, depended on the areas of legislation I was working on, whether it was financial legislation or trade or technology legislation, was to do that job. Whatever I thought about the EU, and whether we should be there or not, I, I saw my job as going to Brussels, representing the people of London and representing companies, representing individuals and making sure that I made sure that the legislation that, it, that emer eventually emerged from the EU was, um, you know, was proportionate and wasn't too damaging to, to, to London. That as simple as that. And you put aside your personal beliefs because you've got a job to do. You're elected, that's your responsibility. Um, how do I think the EU institutions should, should, should be reformed? I think there are a number of things, but I think in some ways there are some good things about European politics. I mean, quite, for example, I think one of the things I probably would have struggled with coming back home here would have been um, the sort of adversar more adversarial nature of politics in Britain. Mm. I actually got used to over the 14 years of coalition building. And I became, you know, being quite immodest, reasonably good at building coalitions, mm. um, to get myself elected as leader of the group, but also when, within the European Parliament. Um, and I think that that's something actually I would, I, I wish British politics could learn from more in terms of co building, bu building coalitions around central issues. But I think particularly the European Parliament is very, very distant from people. I mean, if you think most people can't name their MEP. And I think after 99, when we moved to regional lists and you have eight MEPs for London or four for the North East, mm -hmm. that removed that, that created more distance between the individual elected politician and the, and the constituents. At least be pre-99, you actually had individual MEPs for, say, London North or London South. So would you move back to that system of direct representation? I, 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 would, I would personally, um, but um, even if it meant I, I probably wouldn't, probably wouldn't get, elect, get elected, depending on what seat you, you stand in. But I think that was, a, in terms of 
been having a demos and people feeling a connection mm. to those institutions i think they need to identify with their politician but i don't know i mean what do you think given that you were a national politician and you had a constituency do you think that was a very important link for you as a MP with your constituency that you were directly elected? I think it was a very important link per se, really. And um, certainly constituents tended to know who their MP was and who to go to if they had a problem. Actually, they came to me with lots of problems I could do absolutely nothing <laughs> about because I was the wrong person I had to come and see. But I think they would have felt more disenfranchised if they didn't know who the MP was. Yeah and didn't feel they had that sort of personal relationship with them. But, uh, but you survived your experience in Europe and came out of... Came, you lost your seat in the end, didn't you? So I did, you yeah. I think it was, it was, I think it was John Brandreth who once said, uh, the people have spoken, bastards. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, um, that, that's, a, that's a democratic process and you accept it. You know, if you put yourself up for election, and I think I think it's good. I think it keeps us it keeps us straight, and I think it, it's accountability. Yeah. And, I, and I think the sad thing is where there are politicians who think that they are invincible um, or it all goes to the head. I think that's a wonderful thing about democracy. You know, even you know people who have been incredibly famous or you know, well known have lost their seat, and that's and the, the people have spoken. Yeah. I think that's really important. And probably even more now, seats are becoming less safe. than yes. they have traditionally been certainly in the national parliament. Yeah, that's that's true. So, yes. Um, keeping MPs on their toes. Yep. But sticking on the theme of, of Europe and without getting directly into, into Brexit, Robbie, I'm you... Talk about Europe without <laughs> <any friends. laughs> well, I'm actually going to move on a little bit to your role in, in Number 10, mm -hmm. working with Theresa May. Um, you must have spent a lot of your time working on the Brexit issues. What, what was your role behind the scenes in those days? Uh, <clears throat> so I spent... Oh, no more than 90% of my time working <laughs> on Brexit, so don't worry, we didn't totally dominate. Um, Brexit, it, it's quite complicated, and one false step in briefing um, from a minister or giving to a journalist, you can cause absolute mayhem. i give you uh, just one example. Um, we're taking a flight uh, to Brussels, and just before we got on the flight, um, there was a report coming out of Brussels that they'd made some what on the face of it looked like a concession on the backstop. When we looked at it a bit closer, it wasn't nothing of the kind. And we were going to say as much when we arrived in Brussels. So on the plane, we briefed, and it was, I won't name any names, but it was the Times journalist, <laughs> just in case you needed to know. Um, on background note, that this is what we were going to say. What we hadn't quite clocked is that nowadays you can actually file from midair. <laughs> So when we arrived, the pound had like lost 10% of its value on the basis of this erroneous briefing. Um, so we, it became this almost a, you know, a badge of honour about how much you could knock off the value of the pound by your briefing on Brexit. So my, my day um, consisted of my phone going, my alarm going off with Radio 4 at 5 to 6. Leap out of bed. So there's no sort of snooze alarm. Leap out of bed. I had like five minutes to shave and then silence in the room, I listened into the morning bulletin, and one in three I would have to complain about the 6am bulletin on Radio 4. The reason why it mattered so much is that all the BBC journalists can get access to that text and they would cut and paste the, the copy into all kinds of Radio 1 and stuff. So I'd, my main priority was to get that bulletin right, then my job was done for the rest of the, the morning. And then I'd have, then I would, my wife, long suffering, um, would bring a piece of toast and uh, and then I has had these conversations there with Norman Smith is anyone listening to today program so Norman Smith okay question what time is Norman Smith's two-way on Radio 4 I mean, they really people say it's uh, 635 it's 637 in case you're interested um, so the key is to get his two-way right so I would speak to him give him number 10 source and all this kind of stuff and try to steer him um, and then I'd be out of the door by half six, chatting, then I'd have to listen to the, this briefing at this uh, two-way, uh, then talk to the Sky, and then talk to the Evening Standard, get to work at half seven, already in a bad mood, because I've been <laughs> rowing since half past six, uh, obviously quarter past six. Um, then we'd have a morning meeting with special advisors at, six, at uh, eight o'clock in the morning at number 10, and then at half eight with the Prime Minister um, to go through there. By this stage, I'm like, 
like had a full day, um, but it's only just starting. And then there would be multiple Brexit meetings, probably two a day of different orders. So Ollie Robbins, Sir Ollie Robbins, um, was obviously the chief negotiator, the prime minister. What you, the way it works is that he would produce these papers that would then be circulated, just to add to the things you have to read. You read this sort of, you know, particular aspect on customs union or whatever it happens to be, or customs arrangement, or what we called the facilitated customs agreement or the new customs partnership. Discuss with that later if you're interested. Um, and then we'd have a discussion about strategy and what he could say, and, and then he would go away. Um, and then, but these these discussions didn't take place with the Brexit secretary. So the, so the key thing is that the Ollie Robbins was the Prime Minister's advisor, and then so she would have all this, and she she was phenomenal reader mm. of uh, of information. But because someone again, uh, you know, I I supported Brexit. I, I left the BBC primarily because I wanted to make sure Brexit was done and I was right up and close to all the action. Um, but it, in the end, there was a key moment where, where, where the basically the, the, you know, the resignation of David Davis the Sunday after Chequers, which was where we agreed our proposals going forward of a, of a uh, close relationship with, with the EU, EU once we've left. That was the death knell of the of the government because everything followed because up until that point we were only being attacked from one side of the party from that moment on we were attacked from both and it basically dominated every i would do every briefing for every minister anything about brexit it just it's a long answer but mm. basically dominated so are you saying that theresa may and her small coterie of advisors at number 10 made every decision the Brexit secretary really wasn't involved in the, in the decisions that got made. Um, so it depends. So David, so David Davis, um, who is a great man and a friend of mine, and I would I have a bad word say against him, but he had a particular view of the way forward, mm. and without going into the nuances of it, what he wanted was just never going to happen. It's around, it's around regulation, around regulatory acceptance. Do we have? mutual equivalence that means our regulations are accepted by the other side or do we have some form of alignment on regulations if we wanted the frictionless trade that would allow us to deal with the Northern Ireland problem and deal with just in time supply chains you had to have some kind of regulatory alignment otherwise you need some other way of dealing with Northern Ireland he didn't buy that he had a different view he stayed loyal all the way mm. so the more he wasn't part of the project the more he distanced himself mm. then you got Dominic Rabb who was there for a short period very clever man but he wanted the leadership and therefore he couldn't. The person actually I was most impressed with was the current Brexit Secretary, Steve Barclay, mm. because he's someone, I don't, we've all seen it in our lives, anyone can find problems. Mm. What you really want in type of a team is people that bring solutions. He was as Brexity as the other two, but he would look at the problem and the more he became a part of the solution, the more he was involved in the decisions. Mm. And he, in the end, was in virtually all the meetings. So the atmosphere must have been extraordinary at times like that i mean was it constructive was it stressful was it toxic how would you describe the number 10 um, atmosphere so i've i've worked on many losing campaigns so once i'm involved in a campaign you big alarm bells should, should roll <laughs> so i worked with francis maud um before i worked for bbc um when he was shadow chancellor up against your bosses uh, we got completely stuffed. Um, but people always say then, you know, how could you do that? You're about 100 points behind in the polls. Mm -hmm. Same with this, how could you cope? The, the truth is, you, if you're working with people you respect, um, people who are fun, it was great fun. I mean, some lovely people who I'm very close friends with. Prime Minister who, Theresa May, who I admired because of her integrity. I mean, whatever people's reservations about her and is that she was massively hard working and had the interest of the United Kingdom. You know, there's so many politicians are are in it for ego reasons. You know, love the you know, the glamour um, and being famous. Not her. You know, every day, every Saturday, Theresa May would be out canvassing in her safe seat of, of Maidenhead, and because she's a, and that's why she's one of the few former prime ministers that's staying on as a member of Parliament. So on the we got no confidence uh, on one occasion. It was obviously quite stressful, 
and we run this campaign and then we won we won it it was a great celebration glass of wine and some crisps and um, <laughs> that's how that's how we roll at number 10 um, no twiglets <laughs> there were no twiglets um, and then next morning she was up bang her box done all the papers read all the comments done as if nothing has happened wow okay well you, you we'd Moving on to sort of integrity and politics, I mean, Theresa May clearly was a woman of immense personal integrity. I think looking at the political leaders now, she sort of stands out. As I have no idea what you're referring to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as, as quite a remarkable woman in, in some respects. I think in, in some ways people think much more of her now that she's left the office of Prime Minister than they did at the time. But you must have met a lot of MPs when you were in that position and before. Um, at the BBC. I mean, do you think that most of them really are there for their own egos, or do you think that most people go into politics with, as it were, wanting to do good? Well, I spent 20 years at the BBC, and I was, you know, a massive advocate for members of parliament um, who I, I thought a good company. I think they were clever people, in it for the right reasons. Um, <laughs> to be honest, my view of them went down when I was at number 10. Um, two particular concepts that, you know, it was leaking. Mm. So you would have, you know, a cabinet meeting or a private meeting, the contents of which were then regurgitated to Steve Swinford, who was at the Telegraph at the time or other, which I just found just unbelievable. I mean, imagine, a, a pri imagine here, you have a private meeting and then suddenly the contents in the paper you, there's no way to run a government and I, I, so that shocked me the other thing is is the i mean you know the ego thing and obviously not for repeating outside these rooms but the the, the social media twitter mm -hmm. basically creates this it does with journalists as well it creates an incentive for politicians and journalists to do things that are sort of loud and extreme and controversial which distorts I mean, without naming names, and when I say that, but just I, I can think of the one in my mind. Um, they just love, oh, you know, suddenly they're obscure backbenchers, and suddenly they, because they're going to pop up on the Today programme, you know, and slagging off the Prime Minister and their own party, they suddenly love it, and they get re they do it write these extreme tweets, and they get retweeted, look how great am I. Mm. So I think ego is a massive problem in politics. And made worse by, by social media. Totally, yeah. Did, did you find the social media sort of epidemic um, infecting the European Parliament at all, Said? I, mean, I think it infected uh, politics generally. Yeah. Um, and I, 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 mean, I agree with Robbie, and I've spoken to a number of friends. Uh, I had, a, I had a lunch with a friend last week um, who works in broadcasting, and she said many of her colleagues also don't like social media, and it's really changed the nature of the job. Um, and I, you know, when you go into politics, I think most people, uh, going back to an earlier question, go into politics for, for the right reason, whichever party they're from. They want to make the world a better place, and they want to leave the world a better place than when they entered politics. And that, that's regardless of their ideology or which, which, which party they join. Um, and, but one of the things you have to realise as a politician, you, you tell people this, is that you are a public punch bag. People think they can come up to you as a politician and say things to you, or write and, and say pretty unpleasant things to you, and you just have to accept it. I remember when my stuff, my, my office would get phone calls from people, pretty abusive phone calls or abusive. We about, must stop making yeah, phone calls. <laughs> I, 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 this was a real hint for you to stop it, actually. Um, and I used to say to them, "I just that's politics. I've just got you know I, that's the way politics is." Um, you know, I, you know, I used to joke, "I is their bitch." You know, I've got to, I've got, I've got to accept it. But what hap what's happened with social media? It's made it really, really unpleasant. People can just, you know, they, I mean, they can say, you know, it, 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 can, it can be quite libelous and, uh, you know, and, and slanderous. And you, there's nothing you can do about it. You know, I remember once I had a meeting with Uber, and it was quite topical now. And I got a torrent of abuse from the sort of black, black cab lobby saying I was being paid by Uber, I was corrupt, how much money am I earning, why didn't you admit it all? And I, thought, I just went to meet this company, and, you know, and talk to them. So what was your strategy for dealing with that? Did you, um, I think... Cry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> who, who was it? Was it um, John Major? I can't remember, actually. Who was it who said they just didn't read the newspapers? They all claim. They all claim. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, you know. I, I, I tried not to read Twitter, but 
you know, your, when you've got a press team around you as well, yeah. they want you to put stuff out on social media and they want you to try and use it as a sort of one-way channel. But of course you read stuff because you're supposed to interact with the public. And social media is supposed to be another way of interacting with the people who vote for you, who put you there. Whether they agree with you or disagree, you know, they, they are entitled to inter interact with you, ask you questions, maybe criticise you. But when it got, it got, it did get very unpleasant towards the end. I think it's got a lot more unpleasant since since I was in Parliament, actually. Yeah. And it's not that long since I was there. Um, but the advent of social media has, you know, really accelerated that process uh, enormously. But do you think now that the public are just expecting too much of politicians? Um, I genuinely don't know the answer to that question because I think politicians always think it's different now, and that their, you know, their, their predecessors uh, had it easier. But actually, when you look back to some of the sort of, you know, some of the old sat sat satirical magazines that there used to be in this country, and the way that public figures were ripped apart and actually you know quite unpleasant things and unpleasant cartoons and quite personalized i i suspect what it is it's far more immediate now you know where you know you would have to wait a week or a month for that periodical to come out and read about that particular per politician it's immediate you're immediately attacked um and i i, I think that's the worst thing really about it so so maybe i could ask you Robbie how you think politics should deal with this challenge of social media and with the expectations that are now put on them that I really don't think were there in the same to the same extent if you go back uh, 20 or 30 years how do you think they ought to be what's the communication challenge as it were and how ought they be rising to meet it so my, my concern about social media is less the unpleasantness, actually. Um, it's more the effect it has on behaviours of the media and, and politicians. It distorts their decision making. So one of, the, one of my irritations, which is why I think you can only become director of communications for two years because you just become permanently angry. The period between morning, it literally just sort of links up and it's like 24 seven there, there's no respite at all. So my objection, um, was you know let's take for example the political editor of the uh, of the BBC which will remain nameless Laura Koonsberg so 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 this is the crazy thing and I've said this to her so many times so we're going to do a statement at 10:30 so we initi issue an op note 10:30 statement we're going to say something on Downing Street quarter past 10 what are you going to say well, she's going to say in 15 minutes. Well, I said, Laura, why do you need to know that? Oh, because I need to make plans. No, you don't. You want to tweet it. The whole thing is about to, to what end? I mean, we well, just wait 15 flipping minutes. Meanwhile, it's now 12 minutes, of course. But I mean, I know because this conversation is row has been going on. No, but then I used to say, to, let me say, OK, if I wanted to do that, I could just tell you. And then they'll be kind of, oh, who's leaked that information? What, what is that? Just focus. I mean. The other, the other thing about it, which just, this is just getting something off my chest while you're here, if you don't mind. That's why I do this. This is therapy for you. This is therapy. <laughs> this is why there's no other reason to do this. I just need therapy. Um, uh, what's my point? I, was gonna, I lost my point now. Good all, all, all the hilarity. <laughs> yeah. um, oh, I know, yeah. I was going to say, yeah. So in the good old days, um, that whenever they were, I thought the role of a journalist presenter was to ask the questions like you were doing tonight, on behalf of the people who were listening. So that's no longer become the thing. It's all become, can I get a car crash interview out of it? Not that the public wants to see a car crash. It was my understanding, all my people I speak to, I'm fed up with radio misery in the, in the morning. They want to know what's going on, not always what's going wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it's back to the social media issue. It just distorts, it, you know, there was of course some tough interviews that Jeremy Paxman or the Andrew Neil but every interview is like that now. It's all about running down the politician, particularly if you're a mainstream politician from Labour or Conservatives, trashing them. And what is the purpose of that? I mean, I mean one of the sorts of things about back to Brexit, which always leads back to that, is, you know, every, I spoke at this um, broadcast, I was very really tired, I'd been up really, <laughs> I was really ratty, and therefore I sort of, I was slightly rude about it. They played this video of the thing about it, and they showed, it was a very nicely produced video, and there was all these people, not, oh, I don't know really about what, what the detail of Brexit is, and da 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 da. So endless people, and there's been thousands of hours about Brexit coverage. 
but the public still don't know. The reason they don't know about it is because they're not covering the substance of it. They're covering some row. They're covering Steve Baker slagging, slagging like us off. The tittle tattle, as far yeah, as it's, like it's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's infuriating. And then I've got, you know, I've got friends who aren't. I have like one friend who's not involved in politics or journalism. I tried to exaggerate. There were many, but <laughs> yeah. uh, there's just like one friend. And they say, and I'd explain, well, what's happening in Brexit? And I, I'd, I'd, I'd explain, where do I find that? Where, where do I go? And I'd say, mm, I'm not quite sure, just ask me. But there is nowhere you can actually, you think about that. If I, if I could, I'm going to quiz you all, so get ready after this. I, one by one, I'm going to quiz you some various things about, about the backstop and, and I'll have these things. Most people, even really informed people, mm. you know. I must say, even I find it difficult to keep up with the debate on no, Brexit. It's got because, because they don't, because it's, it's the... No one's interested in explaining what, what it is. It's all about trying to create some drama. Yeah. Um, yeah. That reminds me, when I um, did my first bit of media training, it was two ex-BBC journalists. And they said, I want to tell you, when you go for your interviews, don't expect a polite chat. We don't really want to know what you what, 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 you know about the subject. Which we're after two things. One is we're trying to trip you up. Mm. Or two, if we can't trip you up, we want a good sound bite. Just remember that before every single interview. Mm. And I just thought that was really interesting because I'd never seen that. I just assumed it was a discussion and, pe and we were informing the public. Mm. Well, I'm going to change the topic of conversation completely now, Saeed, and ask you about, uh, about something else, which is your interest in interfaith relations. And I know that your interest is shared by many people here um, at the university. And I was going to ask you, as a practicing Muslim in politics, whether you think um, there is a clash of religions in society today. Right, um, well, um, well uh, before I start, I just want to say actually, kind of, since I've been here at St Mary's since the beginning of September, can I thank everyone here, and you know, mm -hmm. all the members of staff, and I've just felt incredibly comfortable here. And I, I've, you know, I've, one of the things I like about this place is not only the, the sort of size and the community here, but actually the fact that people are free to speak their mind. <laughs> It's quite sad when you think about a lot of academic play, a lot of universities and academia where people feel they have to have safe spaces or you can't say that, particularly if you are someone of faith. Mm. It's very, it's much, I think that's, you see this in politics a lot more now. If someone has a faith, has faith and they have put particular principles deriving from that faith, they can be hounded mm. over that. And it's much easier, actually, I think it's relatively easier for Muslims to say things than, say, Christians. I think, you know, I, I'm not saying that because this is a Catholic university. I genuinely believe that. I think political correctness helps Muslims get away with some of the, the, the beliefs that we have, which are very similar to, to, to uh, many people of, 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 of other faiths. Um, I don't think there's an inherent uh, um, a conflict. I think um, there's a really interesting book that Jonathan Sachs wrote um, about the three Abrahamic faiths. And after about how after 1400 years they all go through their own sort of turmoil as it, as it were um, and partly it's because it's you've been long enough since the beginning and people are still asking the questions um, and also try, that conflict of trying to interpret it interpret it in a modern context and I think a lot of the, uh, the sort of extremism the terrorism that we see emanating from people who call themselves Muslims I think actually is a manifestation of the internal conflict in Islam um, I think there are a lot of people. You know, a lot, a lot of those attacks um, were to kind of, you know, show that to fellow Muslims, sadly, that that that, that, that you know that we are in the ascendancy here, and it's 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 it's, very, you know, it's clearly very worrying. Um, but I don't think there's an inherent conflict. Mm. I think there are you know if if you think about a lot of the victims of terrorism are actually Muslims themselves. Mm. It's you know um, and uh, you know, a lot of a lot of people people are attacked and. Most Muslims, I think, you know, particularly you know, most Muslims in Britain, just have exactly the same issues as people from any any other any other walk of life. And I think when you talk about interfaith, one of I when I was in the European Parliament, I did quite a few things with the former president of the Parliament, Antonio Tajani, who was very interested in interfaith. He actually took it seriously. And we'd have these grand meetings of imams and rabbis, and uh, and and priests and vicars and bishops, and we were all dressed in their fine clothes and everything. And I remember thinking. Actually, the best interfaith are not these grand meetings. It's actually the school playground, mm. people growing up together, and just realising, you know. So when I grew up in North London, you know, I had lots of friends of different faiths, and I understood that my Jewish friends went to a different assembly or did something different on Saturday, 
or you know, and, and learnt about their religious days. They would learn about ours. We'd learn about each other's festivals. And you know, I went to a Church of England school. I'm sorry about saying that in the Catholic University. I apologise. Um, you know, um, and you know, and I learned. I, I learned about. I learned about. And I think that's, that's a far more important way of doing it. I mean, I was um, very struck this week um, when reading about a former colleague of mine, a, a Labour MP called Rob Fellow, who was elected at the same time as me uh, as a Labour MP converted to Catholicism while he was a member of parliament uh, and quite recently left the Labour Party and joined the Liberal Democrats. He was then selected as the candidate for the Liberal Democrats in his own seat and the night before nominations closed um, the party said he could not stand for the Liberal Democrats because, well reading between the lines, because of his orthodox Catholic views. And it's quite, I just wonder whether I mean, I totally accept that there isn't a clash of religions, whether what we're facing really as people of faith and as a Catholic university is whether this is a clash between religion and secularism and whether you think there is a hostile secularism uh, emerging. Um, I do. I do think there is uh, a fundamentalist secularism emerging that people uh, cannot express their uh, religious views or, or shout it down. And actually, I found particularly at the European level, sort of the European liberal group there. And, and I call, I'm, I'm someone who's ideologically a classical liberal, but you know, having been a Conservative Party, I found there was an illiberalism or intolerance amongst people who call themselves liberal. They're not, you know, um, and it, 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 I mean, I remember some of them, there were a couple of MEPs when I was there who always used to bash religion and just thought religion, religion was backward. Just by, just by definition, it was backward. And I just couldn't believe how illiberal these people were who call themselves liberal. They were some of the most intolerant people. And I, I, I think we all have to be aware of this sort of fundamentalist secularism. I mean, Theresa May, Robbie, was um, the, famously the, the daughter of a vicar. Um, do you, how do you think that played with, um, with the public? Uh, I have with the public. Um, yeah. Well, I, I mean, the, the views of her, weirdly, you mentioned her, you know, history will see her more positively I than it. So. I, I think, actually, the, the country were more positive, even during the time she was there. I mean, the, 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 the Westminster bubble, particularly some of the hardcore Brexiteers, and the fact we had a hung parliament, um, meant that it was very, very difficult for her and the party during that period. But all our focus group, Research said, you know, actually rather, rather rated her. I mean, they there's a bit of pity, which was a problem because of the situation. Um, in terms of religion, I never, I think it was probably what underpinned her stoicism and her approach to politics. But she, I don't think she went to church every Sunday. So the two things you could never, I mean, I, my basic role was fundamentally making her do things she didn't want to do. <laughs> At times, she certainly didn't want to do it. So the two things you couldn't. Uh, interrupt, although I occasionally did, was one her church on Sunday morning. Um, so if you wanted to do ma, that caused some issues. Um, and secondly was her gym, which she did on, on a Saturday, she had a personal trainer. Um, so that, I mean, that's how she managed to cope with this amazing workload and she's, I think she's 61, 62, um, and worked incredibly hard. But I never I never, I mean, the, the, her diabetes was a bigger issue. Yeah. Um, yeah. In, in, with her, she would just like slightly weirdly in a bit of conversation get up and <laughs> go and inject herself, with, you know. Um, and she'd always have to eat at a certain time, you know, if I don't know if it was a, a diabetes, but I mean, you, you've got to control it, keep an eye on it. So she had that to deal with on top of everything else. Mm. Being, you know, a woman in a, mm. you know, being pro with a female prime minister in a very, you know, un-women friendly or certainly traditionally unfriendly. Do, do you think the media found her being a woman an issue? I, I personally don't. I mean, I was thinking about this the other day. I mean, mm. I think she did. And certainly a lot of people around her felt that was an issue. It's quite, I mean, I, I probably can tell I just say it as I see it. Mm. I'm not here to present anything in any particular way. Um, look, I mean, she got to become prime minister. You know, it can't, can't have been got to be that hostile to a woman, you know, she was the longest serving Home Secretary and a very successful, one of the few people who were Home Secretary that didn't end up having to resign for one reason or another. She went on to be Prime Minister in, you know, the mm. second only female Prime Minister. So, you know, women can do well in politics, demonstrated by her. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was just going to 
ask both of you actually about something that, that, that must have been a hugely formative experience in both of your lives. Thinking back to a completely different topic now, to the, to the fall of the Berlin Wall and the fact that people around that time started to talk about the fact that democracy had sort of taken over the world, that globalisation was now there forever, that uh, international institutions you know, were embedded, uh, that you'd sort of get a liberal economic system in place that couldn't be shifted very easily. And yet, I think people now would look back and say it really wasn't the end of history mm. at that time. What, what do you think about the state of politics today? So I, I'm always suspicious of people that say it's the end of history or, you know, there's no, nothing else to be invented. I remember someone talking about, a, I can't remember the name of the band now, that's saying, oh, all the best names have already been invented, mm. which is absurd. Um, so just on the Berlin Wall, I, have a, I don't know if you've ever admitted this, but I may as well be in for a penny and for a pound. Um, when I was a student, uh, age 19, and the Soviet Union was in full flight, quite a number of students, many of whom are now members of parliament, um, got involved with an organisation called NTS. Do you know about this? Do you know about this? Shall I admit this? It's Go in the papers. Go on. <laughs> so, um, so basically, lots of conservative students of that generation, about 83, used to, it's very exciting, we used to go to London meet this guy called Steve, who's a Russian guy, <laughs> and um, we basically, dozens and dozens and dozens of us, went to the Soviet Union um, smuggling letters to dissidents. Oh. Um, so we'd, what we'd do, we'd have to, you'd get onto the plane with your bag of letters and you'd go into the toilet and you'd put all down these things down here and then you'd go through the thing and then you would distribute them around. This is the time, obviously, before that you get information. Mm. And they, some of these were sort of dissidents, some of them. And there were hundreds and hundreds of conservative students mm. throughout the early 80s some of them now members of parliament, some of them ministers. Mm. And, um, and one of the questions we were asked, in terms of what triggered their memory, is how long do we think the Berlin Wall will mm. stay up? Mm. And I just said some names of um, 10 years. I never thought it would ever come down. It's an absolute extraordinary, mm. actually, think about it. It's just recently, the anniversary, wasn't mm. it, of me yes, saying yes, some of the pictures. Yeah. What an amazing, amazing thing that, A, it was there in the first place, and B, it came down. Mm. But to some people, at least, the edges of democracy, or maybe not just the edges, seem to be fraying. And, well, there's a lot of tension, there's a rise of populism. Yeah. I mean, what, what do you think are the roots, roots of that malaise? Or do you think there is a malaise? I'm going to not answer your question, because I disagree with the premise, actually. So there's a, my favourite Twitter account. It's called humanprogress.org and it's very optimistic. So one of the great distortions is the way our media works. It means it gives a complete false impression of what's happening in the world. And it, and it leads to populism, I can tie in with your question. Because, so fact one, um, fewer people um, this year have died in the whole year through, through violence and war in the history of time. Because you, your assumption when you listen to the news is that oh, it's the worst, terrible. Life expectancy around the world is at an all-time high. Every single possible indicator for human progress, the world is getting richer, safer, healthier. You would not get that impression from Western politics. And the reason it matters, other than just accuracy matters anyway, it matters because if you have a constant diet of despair, a council of despair, then you have to turn to the extremes. You have to talk, turn to the Corbyns or the or the uh, the Trumps of this world. When actually, what you really want is more of the same because it's working. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's a struggle. Of course, there's the biggest problem I think in society at the moment is intergenerational unfairness, mm -hmm. and that's re re mostly related to housing. But for Christ's sake, you know, even within the short period, you know, when I when I was growing up, I mean, I remember saving up and to buy a single for the carpenters. You know, I was so excited. Now my girls just have, you know, Spotify come out of their ears, anything they want. Mm. So, you know, there's huge improvement. And it matters because free markets, capitalism provides everything that we want, mm. but we're, we're so sort of spoiled. So you think the, the move to the extreme in the West has really been driven by media and by the prism through which 
reality is reflected. I'd like to put it slightly deeper. I think there's there is an absolute problem we've had. You know, low, low unemployment, prosperity, peace, mm. and the, you know, if you're grown up with that, then there's no memory of younger people coming through that. That doesn't have to be the way. It can be bad. You know, if you, as some politicians in this non-partisan, you know, intend to increase our spending by ludicrous amounts, as if that won't affect all our livelihoods. You know, if you tax people up to the hill and do all these things, bad things can happen. Mm. You know, but people just assume, you know, the wonderful things. You know, you go to London and you know, lovely restaurants around here. I mean, what a vibrant place Teddington is and, and Twickenham. But that never used to be the case. It never used to be as, as cool and trendy, and and it and it can be lost if you if you treat you know. So I'm not blaming the media. That's too narrow. I'm just there is a natural consequence of the longer we have for peace and and prosperity, the more people think it's forever. But it's not necessarily forever. Mm. Are you optimistic, Said, about the future? Do you think politics is in a good state at the moment? Those are two different questions. Uh, um, I'm, I'm always optimistic. Uh, optimistic. I just want to go back to the Berlin Wall, really, yeah, because I, I studied Russian at school for, for four years. I did a lot of Russian literature. I was always fascinated in, in that, that region. Um, and I remember going, even as a, a student, uh, in, interrail in Hungary, Romania, the old Yugoslavia. I didn't think, I, I didn't think the wall was going to come down uh, w w when it did. I, and I, I knew and hoped at some stage that those regimes would lose their legitimacy but i didn't think it would happen quite so quickly and it was very interesting when i remember we used to talk to all these organizations that were working behind the iron curtain um and we were saying you know what we need to do is just spread more information people understand what it's like on the other side and that will lead to pressure but a lot of a lot of these people you know you know uh, to even say that would be uh, you know would, 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 would get them, would get would get them locked up when i think some of my friends today um, I am. I'm going to go off on a tangent here. I, I'm. I'm. I'm in a, a band with some uh, a couple of Latvians in the band, and when I, we were, we were, when I was in Latvia at the weekend, and we quite often talk about um, you know, the, the the past for them, and he tells me about the guitars that they had to build themselves and 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 and, and, and smuggle in, smuggle in, and also they never really thought you know they really never thought mm. that there would be freedom in that way, but they say that a lot of the younger generation. It's not even part of their memory. Mm. It's, ve it's very, very different. So when people who are conservatives now will talk about um, Britain in the 1970s, for example, <laughs> that's like someone telling me when I was a child in the 1970s about World War II. Mm. And I think, well, that means nothing to me. World War II meant nothing to me as a kid in the 70s. In the same way that you know, the winter discontent and all that sort of stuff won't mean anything to the young kids today because it was, t it, it, it was, it was too distant. But overall, in answering your question, I, I've, I've always had this faith in humanity and, and, and man's in, innovation. And I think whatever the, whatever the problems are, I do have this sort of faith in the fact that, you know, whether it's climate change or whatever, man's ingenuity to face these problems, tackle the problems when we, when we put our mind to it. Um, and, I, you know, I can't say where that comes from. Does that come from man, uh, mankind itself? Does it, become, you know, does it come from faith? I, I'm, but I've always had this... I've, I've actually got a lot of faith in, in mankind in, in that way. Well, we're coming towards the close of our in yeah. conversation. I'm going to open up to questions in a moment. But I was just, um, before we finish, was going to ask you, well, given your faith in humanity, um, would you advise a young person today to go into politics? And we've got some young people here tonight. If they were interested in going into politics, what would you advise them to do? I, mean, I, do, I yeah, I'm very happy to do that because I do I, I do this quite a lot. Um, uh, one of the things I've very I think is very important is to bring through the, ne the next generations and the younger generations. It's, that's really important. The first thing I would say is whether you like it or not, the political system is still based around parties, unless you believe strongly in a single issue and you join a, a single issue organisation, and therefore you have to join a political party, and you're not going to agree with everything in any political party. So you have to join the party that you agree with most, or the one you disagree with least. Um, and I think you and I had this conversation because I think you also yeah, said did. about, you know, you always have to join a party that you feel more comfortable with. And I spoke to friends from all political parties and we have, a, and sometimes our views aren't that different, but they'll, they'll tell me or we would discuss the reasons they joined one party as, as opposed to the other. I think the other two bits of advice I, I, I give to people are 
when you have a part, you know, if you, you know, if you if with your partner, make sure that your partner really understands what politics involves. I've seen too many relationships break up in politics, too many, you know, families split apart because one partner had not spoken to the other partner about what it actually entailed, dragging around the country, being away from home. I had fellow MEPs who were away for four days and had not told their husband or wife that that's what it would entail and the pressure it puts on politics. And the third thing I'd say is be true to yourself. If you are religious and you go to a, a church, a synagogue or a mosque, or, or another uh, temple, or you're not religious, but you have that moment to yourself when you look in the mirror. Um, and I, for me, it's when I'm in a mosque on a Friday and I'm waiting for the sermon, that quiet moment, and I know my friends from other faiths have those quiet moments. Ask yourself, are you being true to yourself? Are you being true to your beliefs? And there are, some, there are times when you have to make tough decisions. You know, for example, when I told David Cameron that I was going to vote for Brexit, he was angry with me, incredibly angry, and he said, and, I, and he said, why are you doing this? And I said, I have to be true to myself. And he said, what do you mean true to yourself? And I said, what do you mean? <laughs> and I said, you know, it, I'm, I'm really sorry. I've weighed it up and I, believe, I don't want to look back, you know, when I'm on my, you know, when, I, when, when, you know, when I'm on my rocking chair looking back at life or when I'm towards the end of my life looking back and said I had one opportunity and I, you know, and I wasn't true to myself. And I think, be true to yourself. Be clear about why you went into politics. When I became leader of the Conservatives, I remember giving a, a, a quick sort of thank you speech to all the people who voted for me. And I said to them, none of you went into politics to submit to, uh, to sign written declarations or to submit parliamentary amendments. You must have gone into politics for a higher reason. Remember why you went into politics. What was the issue or those issues that drove you into politics? What did you want to change? And it was really interesting because half the room looked at me blank <laughs> and half of them came up to me afterwards and said, thank you very much. I, this is why I went into politics. I said, you know, if, if we can do that as a team and I make you happier and you're, you're more fulfilled, then we will be a better team. And I think that's what I would say to most young people. Wonderful. And uh, Robbie, I'm going to ask you a similar question about broadcasting. If you were talking to a young person here who was very keen on getting into the world of communications and broadcasting in particular, what would you advise them to do? Um, I, I, what, what do I think? Um, the, the mundane things about it is obviously it's a tricky thing to get into and therefore it's a bit like anything. The, the trickier it is, you need to have a, a plan B. But, but I would say just with going into politics, going into broadcasting, it, it's fun. I mean, do something that you enjoy in the end. Work hard. I mean, I have my sort of rule of thing. Work very, very hard at whatever you do, and good things will happen to you. Just be decent to people you work with as well. Um, and choose something. And I mean, pretty much, I, I take a view. It doesn't really matter what. I've done all kinds of things. I rather really enjoyed working in Morrison's when I was in my sixth form. I enjoyed that. Just whatever you do, just do it with huge enthusiasm and hard work, and good things will happen to you, whether it be in going into broadcasting, into politics, you know, um, it's a, you know, it, life is a lot easier if you don't begrudge it. I'm going to sort of end this, this part of the evening by asking each of you the same question, but, I'll, but seeking a one word answer in response. If you were a young person who wanted to change the world, do you think you would advise them to go into <laughs> broadcasting or journalism or politics? Yeah. You do. Else. You do one or, or the something other. Else. You could. You could come up with another one-word answer. Uh, make some money. <laughs> money buys your happiness. I think. I think that's the expression, isn't it? <laughs> You're not going to pin your, your colours to the I mouth. mean, look, the, the, the trouble with both those things, same with acting and all those kind of things, it, it's a risk. I got, I got lucky for tedious reasons. I got myself into the BBC and I refused to leave. But they're incredibly competitive and they don't pay very much money. And everybody, when they when people just go, you know, I don't really mind about money, it does matter. It does, you know, it does matter, particularly when you're buying a house, particularly around here. Um, so you know, there's this whole sort of slightly go, I don't want to make money, it's not that, it's like, 
making, you know, it sounds like bizarre, something you're preaching for becoming a merchant banker, which is not, not what I've done. Um, but you can have influence and impact with money. I mean, yeah, not just that, it's just you can do nice things. You can buy a boat, <laughs> for so, example. I, I, I wouldn't choose. I'm sorry to be. Not, not, you know, I think whichever one you're better at, whichever one you, you know, you know, um, you know if you, you think you're going to be better at, or whichever one you, you enjoy, I think both are ways of changing the world. Um, and, and, and it doesn't have to be either. There are other ways to change the world. You know, one of the things that I want to work on at the moment is a, you know, a project that helps incubate lots more local community charities. You don't have to be a politician to do that. Um, it doesn't have to be politics, um, but po you know, politics or broadcasting gives you a platform if you really believe in something, to uh, a platform to advocate for what you want to change.